I'm just going to mention two of those before I start. One of them is a brand new review. It hasn't even been published yet, but you can find it on the internet by Deidre McCloskey, the well-known economic historian. Uh, if, you, if you Google Deidre McCloskey Piketty review, you'll find it. It's actually a Dropbox file that she's posted publicly. Uh, it's about 50 pages long, and it's terrific. It's really, really good. She talks about a number of issues in the book that I think are very important and very interesting. Uh, so I think that's one thing I would recommend. Uh, other people have uh, found a great deal of fault with Piketty's use of historical data, the ways in which he is trying to fill in the blanks in some very scattered pieces of historical data. I have a friend who's a historian. Uh, um, Josh's name. Phil Magnus, and if you Google Phil Magnus and Piketty, you'll probably find his blog. And on his blog, he's detailed in a series of posts in the last six months uh, a number of different problems with the book. And I think that one's well well worth looking at. Phil's work is well worth looking at, too. So I'm not really going to talk about Piketty's data today. I have a short article with my often co-author, Sarah Squire, who is a, a literature, has a PhD in English literature. We talked there about the problems. Piketty loves to make reference to literature as examples for his for the various arguments in the book. And, and Sarah and I argue that he is, in many cases, misusing literature uh, and not being very uh, accurate in portraying what all this literature he believes helps his case uh, actually has to say. I'm not going to talk about that today. <laughs> all right. What, what I want to try to add to it this morning is, again, to pull out some particularly Austrian criticisms that one might make of Piketty's book. So I'm not going to talk about the accuracy of his, of his historical data. I am going to talk about some contemporary United States data. Um, what I want to focus on mostly is his conceptual framework uh, and, and the conceptual framework that he brings to talking about capital and what capital is and more generally what markets are and how markets work. So my plan is to focus on five areas. Here's my, here's my outline. Okay. Uh, first, I want to talk about what do we mean by capital. He titles his book Capital for the 21st Century, obviously a, a, a sort of homage, tribute to, to Marx's capital. So let's talk about what we mean by capital. I think the second thing I want to talk about is probably the most important. Does capital grow automatically? Piketty argues in his book in some fundamental way that once people possess capital, it just grows and grows and grows, and that's a key part, part of his argument. The third point I want to make, are the imperfections of markets a cause for abandoning them? As you see, it's a, I'll mention in a few places, Piketty seems to argue this way. Fourth, have the rich really taken from the poor? So I want to spend some time talking about the, the U.S. data on inequality and what we call uh, social economic mobility, income mobility. Uh, we'll also talk some about consumption and whether or not the, the trend in consumption in the United States is, is one that shows increased inequality. Um, I want to make that the things people think they know about, about that subject a bit more complicated. And finally, uh, I think I'll have time to talk some about this idea of markets and merit. Uh, Piketty thinks that people who like markets believe that markets reward merit, that, that, that people who get wealthy in markets are more sort of morally better, have more merit to them. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true, and we can talk about some ideas from Hayek that suggest why, why that's not true. So those are the five things I want to talk about. Uh, let me start with by defining capital. And I should say that the ideas I'm going to talk about here for the next few minutes about how Austrian economists talk about capital are going to be important in the later lectures as well, in particular uh, the lecture on marriage and divorce. And that's, uh, I think, the third one this morning. We'll come back to some of these ideas. So what do we mean by capital? For Austrian school economists, what capital essentially is is heterogeneous capital goods. And what we mean by that are specific goods that can serve a variety of different purposes. And those goods must complement each other. That is, they have to fit together in entrepreneurial plans. So if you think about what an entrepreneur does, what an entrepreneur tries to do is to construct a plan of how am I going to take these pieces, these inputs, these various things, put them together, and produce some output that hopefully consumers want to buy. All of those inputs, all of those ingredients that the entrepreneur uses, that's, how Aust that's what Austrians think of as capital. That's what capital is. Uh, one of the analogies I like to use, they're like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, puzzle pieces that have to fit together in just the right way. 
And the other part of this, of course, is that oftentimes the plans that entrepreneurs develop to use these capital goods don't work out. They fail. Right? Entrepreneurs discover that the restaurant they thought would be a, you know, very popular turns out not to be, or the good that they produce that consumer, they thought consumers would buy, consumers don't want to buy. When their plans fail, what entrepreneurs need to do is to now think about substitutes. Okay, why didn't this work? Can we make this a different way? Can we make it more cost effectively? effectively? Can we change the product somehow so that it's more popular? All of those substitutions that, that entrepreneurs make, those are sub, one of the characteristics of capital in the Austrian view is that it, while those pieces have to fit together, they can also be substituted for in, in different, in different kinds of ways. And I should note that for Austrians, this includes human capital. I'll come back to that in a little bit, but all the things I want to say about capital are things that are true of human capital, of us as human beings. We acquire skills. We are productive like those inputs are. So human capital, uh, is, is, is part of the Austrian story as well. So let me, let me add a few details to this. Um, one of the key parts of the Austrian theory of capital is this idea of heterogeneity, that a given capital good has multiple uses to which it can be put. So if you have, think of a computer, right? You can use a computer for a number of different things. It can help you produce a whole variety of different products. For Austrians, this feature of capital goods, that, it can produce, that they can produce multiple things but not an infinite number of things, nor just one thing, is a key idea, right? Because if every capital good can only contribute to the production of one thing, entrepreneurs wouldn't have to make any decisions, right? You have an input, it can only produce one output, you have to use that input to produce that output. And if capital goods were sort of infinitely substitutable, right, that they could be used to make anything, then in some sense you really don't, entrepreneurs don't have to make any choices either. They can, they can use this to produce whatever they want. It doesn't really matter. So for Austrians, the key is that these capital goods have a limited number of uses. And so entrepreneurs have to choose how to use them. I, I have this piece of steel. Am I going to use it for this or this or this? Another way of thinking about this is I want to make something. Let's say I want to build a bridge. Should I build a bridge out of steel, out of wood, out of cement? I have to think about which of the limited number of inputs I can use to, to, make, to make that bridge. So the uses of capital goods are somewhere between one and infinity. Right? And when, when entrepreneurs think about their production plans, they're trying to fit those pieces together in just the right way. The capital of a firm, the, the entrepreneur's capital, has to be complementary, has to fit together. But across the whole economy, we think in terms of, well, again, if this plan fails, what do we substitute from somewhere else into this, into this plan? And so one of the key parts of the Austrian story is the, this idea of the coordination of plans. That what, econ what economies do, what markets do, is help people coordinate their plans. That is, for the entrepreneur to think about what do consumers want, how do I best use these inputs? Consumers have things that they would like to buy. How do we make sure the plans of consumers and the plans of producers are consistent? And how do we make sure that the various plans of all the producers are consistent with each other? And when people make mistakes, when those plans fail, then entrepreneurs have to rethink that. And key to this process are prices, profits, and losses. What market prices and what profits and losses tell entrepreneurs is whether or not they've succeeded or failed. So when we see entrepreneurs making profits, that signals to them, keep doing what you're doing. The, that combination of capital that you're using is a good one. But when firms make losses, when entrepreneurs' profits are negative, that's a signal that tells them, I need to change. I need to undo what I've done and try something different instead. And again, the same is all true of human capital. Right now, you're getting an education, hopefully. <laughs> you're investing in your human capital. You're trying to make yourself more productive. If you're going to college and have a particular, you're studying engineering or studying business or politics or law, whatever, you're investing in a particular specific type of human capital. Right? I teach economics, I can't go teach physics, right? If my university decides we need more physics professors, they're not going to have me to do it. My human capital is fairly specific to economics. Just the same way that certain machines can only produce certain kinds of goods, human beings have limited, uh, greater than one usually, but not infinite number of uses to which our skills can be put. So with that, how does Piketty fit into all this? Well, the first thing to note 
is how Piketty defines capital in his book. This is on page 46 of his book. He says, capital is the sum total of non-human assets that can be owned and exchanged on some market. So the sum total of non-human assets that can be owned and exchanged on some market. Okay, so what might be some problems with this? Well, the first obvious one is he ignores human capital. Right? He says explicitly non-human assets. So for Piketty, human capital plays no role in his understanding of, of, of what capital is and therefore why capital might be distributed inequitably and all the kinds of things that concern him in his book. So, you know, wh why does this matter? Well, at least one reason why this might matter is if we think about it for a minute. Think about a medical student, okay? A student who's studying to become a doctor. That person probably doesn't have a great deal of financial wealth, of physical capital, while they're in medical school. Yet the training they're getting is likely to make that person very wealthy down the road. They have a great deal of human capital. By, by the way, Piketty accounts for these things. That person's poor. That person doesn't have any real capital. But it seem, seems to me that's not right, right? That person actually is very wealthy in the sense they have all of these skills and, and abilities that they've developed. And we, want, we don't want to treat that person the same way we would treat someone who has a low-paying job and doesn't own any assets. And so it seems different to me. But for Piketty's ignoring that, ignoring human capital uh, completely. And that has a number, I think, of interesting, of interesting, creates a number of interesting problems for him. In a couple places, he also uses capital and wealth interchangeably. And again, if you're not considering human capital, I mean, if you, this might make sense if you're not considering human capital. But once we consider human capital, we can see that, again, the, the sort of uh, assets and, and, and skills that people have, both as human, you know, their human capital plus their physical assets and so forth, are not always the same as wealth, right? Um, that we can... Wealth is more than just our physical capital, includes our skills and abilities, as well as other kinds of things we might include in there. And so to just treat capital and wealth the same, I think, ignores some of these, some of these issues. A further problem is this idea that we want to compute the total value of capital. And one of the problems in computing the total value of capital for Austrians is that you can only do that when the economy is in equilibrium. That is, you can only do that when all of people's plans are in full coordination. And let, let me explain what I mean by this. Right? If, if the economy's not in equilibrium, that is, if, if, if we don't have everything allocated just right, okay, we can't be sure that the current value of, of, of capital goods really represents their value to consumers. Let me sort of give an example. Suppose that we have two entrepreneurs who are making two different kinds of shoes. And they're both using a machine and labor to make those shoes. Let's suppose it turns out that one of those shoes people love and buy and think are great. The other kind of shoes people don't want to buy and they think are not a good product and it's a waste of resources. If we try to add up the value of the two machines that are help making those shoes, right, we're going to, that's not, we, we, the, we're not going to get an accurate portrayal of real value. Why? Because the one machine that's making the shoes that people don't want really doesn't have the value that the entrepreneur thinks it does. The entrepreneur may have paid a certain amount to rent that machine or buy that machine, anticipating that consumers would like those shoes. But if consumers don't like those shoes, by implication, that machine isn't creating any value. But if we add it up as part of the capital stock, we're treating it as if it does have value. And so one of the points that Austrians have made, particularly the Austrian economist Ludwig Lachmann, said you can't just add up stuff in the economy and say that's the total value of capital. Because oftentimes we don't know whether those capital goods really have the value that consumers, you know, really are producing the value that consumers want until we see whether or not consumers want those goods. Only if we know the economy is completely in equilibrium, that is, producing all of the most valuable things it possibly can, then we can sort of add up all the value of these things and know that those capital goods, that, that the price people pay for those capital goods is what they're really worth. But otherwise, we can't, we can't do that. So when we think about what Piketty's saying here, okay, the, that, that as if we can look at the real world economy, which is full of mistakes, right? People make mistakes all the time. We can't just add up those capital goods and say, that's the total value of capital. From an Austrian perspective, 
we, we just we can't know that. We're never in equilibrium. So every time we look out at the world, all we see are potential mistakes that people are mating, making, and we just can't add up those capital goods and say, this is the amount of capital people have. We don't know that for sure until we know whether those goods really are producing the things that, that consumers want. And that's the whole challenge for entrepreneurs, right, is to figure this stuff out. So ironically here, Piketty has to, from an Austrian perspective, Petty, Piketty has to assume that the economy is in equilibrium, that is, it's behaving just right in order for him to add up all this stuff. But Piketty, of course, thinks that markets aren't very good, right, at, at getting things right. So he's caught in an interesting kind of uh, potential contradiction there. He also frequently talks about what's known as the marginal productivity of capital. The idea that if you add, if you add another unit of capital, if the economy has more capital, how much more productive will the economy be? If I add this unit of capital, what do I add to the economy's productivity? From an Austrian perspective, this idea of the marginal product of capital as a whole, it, it makes no sense. Okay. Why does it make no sense? It makes no sense because there's no such thing as capital as a whole. There's only specific capital goods. So the real question is if we, if, if an entrepreneur adds one more kind of capital good to his production process, how much more will that help him produce? We can't speak of just capital in the abstract as a whole. It's not this sort of, you know, a blob of dough that we can kind of mush and push wherever we want to. It's about specific goods. And so when we think about the marginal productivity of capital, what we're really thinking about is how well does this capital good go together with this capital good, or this capital good go together with this labor. We always have to talk about capital good, capital goods in specific terms. And the key to that is this idea of complementarity. Do the things fit together? Do entrepreneurs think those capital goods will work together, or that capital, that labor, labor will work together to be productive? The idea that when Austrians talk about this, again, this heterogeneity, this specificity of capital, what that means is, is that its productivity depends on that, how that particular unit fits with the rest, how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. There's only marginal productivity of specific capital goods. And one of the distinctions that Piketty does not make is this distinction between capital somehow as an aggregate and capital goods as specific things that entrepreneurs use. And for Austrians, that is a key, that's a key distinction. Okay, so why does any of that matter? Well, one reason it matters is that market processes, that the growth of capital is not automatic. Multiple times, in fact, in some way it's the very theme of his book, is that, that Piketty treats capital as growing automatically over time. When people own capital, they just keep getting richer and richer and richer. His famous R greater than G right formula suggests that the owners of capital will always get richer than everyone else because the rate of interest, R on capital, is greater than G, the growth rate of the economy. Whether that's true or not is, a, you know, is an interesting question, but even if it's true, it doesn't imply what Piketty seems to think it implies. For one thing, capital just doesn't grow automatically. It's not like a fund or like a plant, right, that you just sort of water it and it grows. Right? For, for capital to grow, it has to be invested and applied to production in ways that create value. This for, for Austrians, this is the key point that we, that we want to emphasize when we think about capital and the growth of capital. It has to be invested in profit-generating activities either through investing financial capital, loaning to entrepreneurs who produce good stuff, or in the ways that entrepreneurs allocate machines to produce particular goods that make profits. Owning capital is no assurance that you will get richer. You have to do the right kinds of things with it. You have to invest in, in all kinds of conscious ways. And that is what we call entrepreneurship, right? That what entrepreneurs do is to decide how to allocate capital goods. To, to what sorts of production processes should we do? I have a computer, I have these other things, what should I make from it? Right? And that's, how, that's what entrepreneurs do. And the key to that, again, are prices, profits, and losses. And those help entrepreneurs make these decisions about how to deploy their capital goods. This is what Austrians call the economic calculation process, right? Uh, when you think about what an entrepreneur does, the first thing an entrepreneur does is formulate a budget, right? I have a plan, I want to produce 
state of shoes. I want to produce a particular kind of shoes. I come up with a plan. I'm going to use this kind of material. I'm going to use this machine, this many people. I'm going to make shoes. I think about a budget. I imagine how many I can sell and what price I'm going to charge. And I engage in that calculation process. Then I go out and try it. And after you know, three months or six months, I look and see, did I make a profit? Did I make a loss? How much or how are things selling? If I made a profit, great, continue. If I made a loss, I have to rethink that. I have to change my, change my plan. The whole reason we need markets is so that, uh, so that entrepreneurs and others can figure out how to produce the things that we want. And that process is, the key to that process, is how they make use of capital, how they deploy capital. So you don't... You know, just owning capital doesn't mean you're going to get rich. You have to use that capital in ways that create, that create value. Markets in this sense are, are sort of you know, discovery processes, to use Hayek's term, right, where we figure out, where we learn how goods should be allocated. And again, this is not in any sense of the word automatic. It's part of this process of economic calculation. And one of the biggest flaws of Piketty's book is that this whole perspective is simply absent. He, he has this very, for lack of a better term, a mechanistic view. It's almost like economies work the way you know the planets go around the sun, that it, it happens in this sort of automatic way that just doesn't seem to involve any conscious human choice, decision-making, entrepreneurship, all of the things that for Austrians are at the very heart of how markets operate. And there's a bunch of interesting, I think, sort of ironies to that. In many places in his book, Piketty criticizes standard economics for being too mechanistic, yet he adopts the same perspective in many ways when he thinks about how, how capital goods work. And what's important for the inequality part of his story is that income and wealth accrue to those who deploy their capital to create value. What makes people rich is not just that they own capital, but that they use it to create value for others. If you, know, if you think about people who got very wealthy in the marketplace, who made them wealthy? We did. We bought their stuff, right? Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, all of these people who are fabulously wealthy are wealthy. We made them wealthy by buying their stuff, right? They made decisions about how to allocate resources in certain ways. They were right. They were things people wanted. We bought them. We made them wealthy. Income and wealth accrue to those who deploy their capital to create value for consumers. And that, that's, that's crucial. It's not just automatic. It doesn't just come from ownership. It comes from the decisions that entrepreneurs make. And one of the things that Piketty just doesn't talk about, almost at all, is the idea of losses. He seems to believe that if you own capital, you generate profit or interest, right? You get wealthier. But there's many people who owned a lot of capital, tried to produce something, turns out, bad idea. They make losses. They're not richer. They're poorer. And that's part of the market, too. In the last you know, five or six years, certainly in, the, in, in Western Europe and particularly in the United States, we seem to have forgotten this point, and we keep bailing out companies who make losses. But it's important. Losses are important. Failure is really important in the market. It's one of the ways we learn what not to do. And I think part of Piketty's problem is, is that he simply <coughs> neglects this altogether and doesn't see the ways in which Capital creates wealth by being deployed in ways that create value. And that's a, that's a key part. Um, and it's a part that I think Piketty, Piketty uh, overlooks. Okay? So uh, if, if I was going to point to one thing in Piketty's book, I think that is really absent. Uh, it's this whole set of issues. There, there's, in fact, if you look in the index at the back of his book, uh, you will not find the terms entrepreneur. You won't find economic calculation, right? So, the, so none of this is there. None of this idea that people have to actually choose how to use their capital. So we can talk, and well, I'll take some questions in a little while. We can certainly talk some more about that. But let me talk about the third point in my outline. That's what we might call the perfect market fallacy. Okay. Um, one of the things about about uh, Austrian economists is that Austrians reject a number of the pieces of mainstream economics that are the things that economists often use as what we call their welfare standard, that is how to judge how good markets are. For Austrians, it's not that markets are good because 
they approximate perfect competition. It's not that markets are good because they achieve general equilibrium or Pareto optimality or any of these things that, that economists talk about all the time. Right? For Austrians, markets are good because they're better. Not because they're perfect, but because they're better. And in fact, for Austrians, markets fail in comparison to those perfections all the time. Real world markets are consistently imperfect. Entrepreneurs don't always get it all right. They make mistakes all the time. We make mistakes about what to buy. Right? Entrepreneurs make mistakes about, again, how to allocate their, their capital gains. Right? And what's, what's interesting about that, it's in these failures that, cre that markets create the opportunity for entrepreneurship and growth to take place. It's because some entrepreneurs have failed that other entrepreneurs can step in and see opportunities. In the, the big debate in many North American cities right now is over Uber, right? The, the ride-sharing company. So why would people want to use this ride-sharing app? And why? Because taxi cab companies have not done the job very well for a variety of reasons. Right? And it's the failure of some that open opportunities up for others. Okay? And it's because some people uh, don't do things well that resources can be reallocated by other entrepreneurs to, to perform those things better. So it's the very imperfection of markets that creates the scope for entrepreneurship and for the possibility of, of improvement. And the problem in Piketty's book, I think, is that in a number of places, what he says is that we should judge real-world markets by the standard of perfect and pure competition or by a perfect capital market. Right? That's what markets, what, he, what Piketty seems to believe is that the case for markets, for people who like markets, like I do, right, that what we believe is that markets are good, are desirable, because they reach perfect competition or, they, or that capital markets are perfect. All right? And that's how we should judge them. In other words, markets are only desirable if they achieve these ideal perfect market, the ideal perfect market of economic theory. Anything less than that, Piketty believes, seems to believe in a way, is a market failure and therefore reason for government to step in. So, for example, in the book on page 114, he talks about the idea of capital earning a reliable and steady income. There's that automatic again. And he attributes that idea to, to, he attributes that to the idea of a perfect capital market. He says, well, isn't that what perfect capital markets are supposed to do? Okay? And then he wants to go on to say, of course, capital markets are perfect, so we shouldn't expect capital to, to, to do these kinds of things. Um, and like many other economists, again, he believes that the failures of markets are sufficient reason for government to step in and fix and fix those things. The problem is, is that Piketty and other economists ignore an important question. Let me give you my favorite story to, to illustrate the example, to illustrate this by example. The story is uh, uh, the story of a king who uh, was auditioning for a new court singer. He wanted to have a, a royal singer who would sing for him in, in, at court. Uh, and so he sent out his the royal staff throughout the country to find the best singer he could find. It's like you know, American Idol or something like that. Right? So he sends out his, his staff throughout the land, and they bring back the two finalists. And the two finalists come to the, to the palace, right? And they're going to sing for the king. And the first one gets up and sings, and when the first one's done, the king looks and says, or listens and says, that's the worst singing I've ever heard, and immediately tells his staff, make the other guy the official royal singer. Now, what's wrong with that story? There's a potential problem there. What is it? Well, this can be worse. Yeah, the second one could be worse. Right? The second one could be worse. And so, just because the first one's bad doesn't mean we automatically want to hand it over to the second one. And the same is true when we think about this idea of market failure. Just because market, markets fail, that markets are imperfect, doesn't mean that government's going to do better. Why not? Because governments can fail too. And what we need to do is what we call comparative institutional analysis. We have to take seriously the possibility that governments are just as, if not more, imperfect than markets are. And this is a point that Austrians have made, but really is a point that's, that comes from the work of the public choice school economists like James Buchanan, or Tulloch and others who really emphasize this point. Okay? The idea that just because markets are imperfect doesn't mean government will do better. We have to ask questions about whether government officials have the knowledge they need to know exactly what 
they should do instead. We have to ask whether they have the right kinds of incentives to do the things we say they should do. Economists draw up these fancy blackboard models that say, here's, what, here's how government should fix this problem. But we often don't ask, will government actors actually have the incentives to do what our model says they should? And we know from history that oftentimes, most of the time, they don't. And oftentimes, they end up making matters worse. Right? So we, when we think about these things, we have to think in terms of, let's look, let's be realistic, right? That's realistic economic analysis, right? We have to be realistic about the role that government plays here. And not, and say, not you know, if we see markets failing, we can't just assume that governments will, will do better. And so that brings us back to a point I made earlier, which is, look, markets aren't perfect, they're only better. And if we hold up the standard of markets having to be perfect as the justification for why markets are good, Markets are never going to be good because they're never going to be perfect. The question is, are they or are they not better than the alternatives? And there's reason from an Austrian perspective to think that markets are better. And one of those reasons is that markets have better, more effective feedback processes. It's not that markets are good because markets sort of hit the target all the time, right? Think about you know an archer trying to hit a target. It's not that markets are good because we hit the bullseye with markets. Rather, markets are good, are better, because when we miss, Markets help us understand that we missed and give us an incentive to correct those errors. When you're a firm and you see your company making losses, that tells you two things. One, it tells you, hey, I've misallocated resources. I need to change my behavior. Second, it, tell, it gives you an incentive to do that. If you don't change your behavior, you're going to keep making losses. And so markets are valuable because they provide that feedback. They inform us and they provide us incentives to change our behavior in the ways we ought to. And the question is, can government do it as well? And Austrians have reasons to think that governments won't, right? That politicians won't. They have more difficulty in, in, in acquiring that knowledge that market signals provide. And the incentives of politics are largely incentives to get politicians reelected and to acquire power. And that's not the same thing as allocating resources in effective, efficient ways. So markets are desirable because they tell us when we're wrong and they give us incentives to make that correction. We might call that dynamic efficiency. So to sum up here, an imperfect market does not mean ipso facto, does not mean automatically that government will do better. And I think this is a po point that Piketty misses in a number of places in, in his book. A whole set of questions around inequality. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to present a couple of points, then I'm going to show you some data. All of my data is U.S. data. From what I know, a similar story is true in Canada. Similar story is true in Western Europe, though not quite as strongly as the argument I'm going to make here about the U.S. But since Piketty talks about the U.S. as sort of his you know, example of inequality gone wild, uh, we, can, we can use the U.S. data to, to make this point. So first thing, even if it's true that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, it's not the same people who are rich and poor year to year. So when we see these comparisons where people say, well, you know, the top 20% had 42% of income 10 years ago, now they have 48%. See, the rich are getting richer, and they, we look at the bottom 20% and their share has shrunk, the poor are getting poorer. What that is saying really is the people who were rich in one year had less, had a smaller share of the different people who were rich five or ten years later. And the people who were poor ten years ago had a bigger share of total income than the different people who are poor this year. Because people move in and out of those quintiles. And we'll talk about that, right? That these movements in and out of those quintiles reflect what we call income <coughs> mobility. And there's a very big debate in economics over just how much mobility there is, and how it relates to income and wealth. So all of these things I'm going to present here in a second are, are, are subjects of, of much debate. Okay? But even the most pessimistic numbers about the U.S. suggest that, the, that a household in the lowest 20% okay, has, has at least a 50-50 chance of moving out of the lowest 20% in 5 or 10 years. So most people are in that lowest 20% for a temporary amount of time. They're not there permanently. And it's not like everyone who's poor in one year is going to be poorer in five years or ten years. Most of the people who are poor in one year are richer in ten years. Not all of them, but most of them. Right? So I want to look at some data that helps us understand this. 
Uh, the first set of data is a little bit older. This is from 1979 to 1988. Okay, It's data from U.S. Treasury who used income tax returns to look at this. Uh, it's old data, but I like it because it's from the 1980s when supposedly you know Reagan was president and the you know, trickle down and the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. So if we can have a little evidence that suggests it's more complicated than that, you know, good for us. So let me let me kind of explain what this is. You can see if you look down, if you look down the left column there, those are those are where people were in 1979. And if you go across, it tells you where those households were nine years later in 1988. This is household tracking data. So it actually looks at individual households and asks them, how much income did you have in 1979? What was your taxable income in 79? What was your taxable income in 88? What this says, if you look at that 14.2% in the upper left corner there, what that means is of the households who were in the bottom 20% in 1979, only 14% were still there in 1988. 20%, 20.7 moved up to the next 20%, a quarter, 25%, we're now in the, the middle class, the middle quintile, another 25% in the second 20%, and over 14% moved up to the top 20%. So you can see there's, according to these data, there's a good amount of income mobility. Just because you start poor in the United States doesn't mean you're going to stay poor forever. And you can see in the other groups similar sorts of patterns. You might notice, by the way, that if you started off near the top, if you look in the lower right corner, Right, the groups that started off near the top tend to stay there. That's not surprising, right? That if you start off wealthy, you're, you know, you're going to stay there. But even there, there were people who started off in the top 20% who fell a quintile or two or three quintiles, right? You can, you, just because you're rich, it's not automatic, doesn't mean you're going to stay rich. The other question you might have about this is, uh, well, if everyone's getting richer, where are the poor people coming from, right? <laughs> Well, guess what? You guys, right? You graduate college. Because there is more opportunity to survive, but there is no money in which city. Yeah, and, 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 you, and, and all of you, you know, if you're in college now, if you're students now, right, you're going to get out, you have your first job, you're going to be relatively poor. The other group who makes up that new poor, at least in the United States, are immigrants, right? Folks who come to the United States and start off at the bottom and work their way up. So it's like a hotel where people keep moving up, you know, up through the floors and new people come into the hotel and take the, 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 the ground floors. So that mobility process is a key part of what happens, in, again, in, in, in Western market economies. Here's some other data. This is a longer stretch from 1975 to 1991. This is from the panel study on income dynamics. It's one of the most widely used data sets in the United States. It, again, tracks households year to year. Very similar num numbers here, even more impressive. Only 5% after 16 years are still in the bottom 20%, and you know, 60% almost moved up to the uh, either first or second quintile top or next to top quintile. These data, there's been a lot of debate about these data and whether or not they're accurate, and there's some more recent data that I'm going to show now that is not quite as uh, impressive as those. This is from 1996 to 2005. Here, it's a different data set this time. This is another treasury, U.S. Treasury data set. Here, 42% stayed in the lowest 20% over that period, but still over half the households who started poor got out of poverty, out of the lowest 20% uh, in that nine-year period. And one more, just so you can get a sense. This is even more recent. Here, to about half, roughly. And this, you know, that was, this is only a six-year period, but only about 44% got out of the lowest quintile. And if we'd stretch that out to eight or nine, ten years, we'd see numbers sim similar to, to, to the others. I, I show these just to make this point, right, that there is significant mobility in the United States. Just because you start out poor doesn't mean you're going to stay poor. The opportunities to move up are there. And a lot of what the, met, the sort of numbers on inequality are capturing are really just people moving through this sort of life cycle. Guess what? Most people start out poor when they have relatively poor, when they get their first job. They work, they get wealthier, they get better at what they do, they get higher wages, their income goes up and up and up, and they sort of move their way through this. That's how it works, right? And new people come in and, and, and come, from, come from the bottom up. So when we look at these comparisons that say, well, the rich had 42% in this year and 48% in another year, that really, that's just comparing two snapshots. It doesn't give us a moving picture. It doesn't give us a film of how people change over time. And what this suggests, anyway, is that there's that 
There's not this kind of static rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. There's people moving up and down all the time. Okay? And that's an important part of, 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 of how market economies work. And I think Piketty underestimates this point in his discussions of, of the of growing inequality. The other thing he doesn't talk a great deal about is what we call intergenerational mobility. Now, those last set of data was about how, how, how a given household moves through time. Intergenerational mobility asks this question. If we look at the children of the rich and poor 20, 40 years later, how did they do? So we can look at some data that compares 1969 and 2000. So there's a sort of generational shift. That's basically 30 years there. The children of the top 20% in 1969. So look at all the people who were in the top 20% in 1969 and look at their kids. In 2000, they had roughly the same income as their parents did in 1969. This is all adjusted for inflation. All right. So, uh, so, those, so those children were just as wealthy as their parents were. And that's not surprising. Again, we would expect rich folks to be able to pass some of that down to their kids. But here's the part that might be surprising. Of the children of the bottom 20% in 1969, 82% had incomes in 2000 that were higher than what their parents had in 1969. And their median income was double that of their parents. So in other words, if you, in 1969, if your family was in the lowest 20% of the U.S. income district, and then we looked at those children, and we looked at their, them as adults in 2000. 82% had incomes that were higher than what their parents were. And their median income, like roughly their average, their median income was double that of their parents. That suggests a significant degree of mobility, if you are interested in where that data is from. It's from uh, a paper on economic mobility of families across generations. So that suggests that when we think about inequality, right, we want to be thinking about these mobility questions too. And that shouldn't surprise us. Markets are these dynamic, ongoing processes where in income depends upon our choices about what to spend and entrepreneurial decisions about what to produce. And it's not automatic, right? People get richer, some people get poorer, right? There's all this shuffling going on. One thing you might be interested in too is the middle class. And again, this is US data. Okay, this compares 1980 and 2006. Um, and this is the percentage of households in various income groups, again, adjusted for inflation. So households under $35,000 per year, uh, there was 43% almost of households in 1980 made that. 2006, those had fallen to 36%. Households in what we might call the middle class from 35 to 70K, 75K fell from 38% to 33%. So there goes the middle class, right? But where'd they go? They went up. Households 75 to 100,000 slightly increased. Look at the households over 100,000. That was 8.6% of U.S. households in 1980. It was more than double that, 19% in 2006. Right. So when we look at this, what we see is that the middle class group did fall by 5.4 percentage points. Right. But this is clearly a net movement upward. Fewer households are poor in absolute terms and fewer are middle class. And more, a greater percentage of U.S. households are above 75,000 or 100,000 than was the case in 1980. So that is pretty good evidence, it seems to me, that you know, it's not that the rich are getting richer or the poor are getting poor. Everybody, almost, is getting richer. The, I think many of, those, many of the folks in that group are uh, certainly trying to save money to invest in their kids' human capital. Uh, but this, if you look at, you know, so, so I guess it is the question that even though they're earning higher incomes, is more of it going to things like investing in their kids' human capital? Yeah. Um, to some degree, yes. Uh, I'm going to present some other data in a minute that looks at cons other things, other consumption measures. But, it, but you're right. I mean, they are. One of the things to be, you know, careful about when you think about, you know, the, uh, the data in the U.S. On, on investing in college, and you see those huge college costs. Like, I teach at a very small private school in the United States. The annual tuition and room and board, the comprehensive fee for my school, is about $60,000 per year. And people go, wow, who can afford that? Well, the answer is, is that very few of my students actually pay the full amount. Right? We have all kinds of scholarships and aid that help them, and that most families pay less than that. My daughter just started this fall at uh, New York University, at NYU in New York City, and the comprehensive fee for her there is about $66,000, $63,000 per year. I cannot afford 
Even economists don't get paid that much, right? <laughs> but it turns out they gave her a scholarship, which is basically half off. Right, the scholarship they gave her knocks that price in half, and, and so at that point, then you know you've got savings, you've got other kinds, you know she's got some loans, and then you can afford it. So you have to be a little careful. You're right, though, that for sort of some middle class families, certainly paying for college is a is a significant what one of the places that their income goes. You know, for them, it's it's worth it. The question then would be, how you know, are they living well still? Right? How are they? You know, are they living? Are they living well? We can, and in a second, we'll we'll, we'll talk some. But yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a that's a that's a concern. So actually, let's talk about uh, there's the source on that, by the way. Uh, so one of the other questions we might talk about here is the difference between income and consumption inequality. When most people talk about inequality, and certainly when Piketty talks about inequality, he's talking about income or sometimes wealth inequality. You may have seen this viral YouTube video on wealth inequality in America where they uh, sort of show what people think the distribution of wealth is, what they think an ideal distribution is, and then what the actual distribution of wealth is. It's a, it's a very well done and clever and deceiving little video if you've ever seen it. One of the problems with that video is the people who wrote it and produced it are not consistent in talking about wealth versus income. They claim they're talking about wealth in America. But at several points in the video, they talk about people's salaries. That's not wealth. That's income. And it's different. For example, older people in the United States tend to be relatively wealthy because they often might, they own a home, they own, own their own home. But they may have low incomes because they're living on, you know, on retirement funds. You can be very wealthy and have low income. Conversely, you can have, uh, think about our medical school person, right? Low income, wealthy in terms of human capital. You can also, by the way, have high income and very little wealth. If you're a playboy, right, you have all this income and you just spend it on, you know, women and wine and, you know, and renting an apartment, you know, or hotel rooms or whatever, and you just spend it all, right? You've got high income, but you don't have any wealth. So income and wealth are not the same thing, and it frequently gets confused. What I want to talk about, though, is consumption, because I think what really matters is what are people actually able to buy that matters for their lives, right? So one thing we can talk about is instead of income inequality, we can talk about consumption inequality. And here the data suggest that inequality has narrowed substantially. Okay. My favorite example, sort of, you know, sort of image to think about here, is think three, four, five hundred, a thousand years ago. Think about the difference between a king and a commoner, even two, three hundred years ago. Right? Kings lived really, really well. The common people. Not so much. How many of you have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Anybody? Okay, yeah. You guys, that's your homework assignment is to go watch the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail. For, for my friends who have, who are, you know, a, a historian friend of mine says it's the most realistic portrayal of the Middle Ages ever filmed, right? And there you see the sort of difference between the king, the sort of fancy king with his horse and, you know, fancy clothes, and the commoners digging in the dirt, right, to make a living. And, and, and if we think back to older times, the gap between what kings could have and what the average person has is huge. Today, the gap between me and Bill Gates, what is that gap consistent? I'm sort of middle class, and let's even take a working class American family, right? Bill Gates has cars, they've got a car. Bill Gates has a smartphone, most Americans have smartphones. Now, Bill Gates probably has a bigger house and more cars and a better smartphone, probably more smartphones than the average American. But the average American has one. Bill Gates can fly around the country. Most Americans fly around the country. Bill Gates has a private plane, maybe two, right? We have to sit, you know, in coach, okay, and on the plane. But it's okay. We get to, most Americans can fly, right? The difference historically, for most of human history, the difference between rich and poor was a difference between have and have not. Now, in the 20th century, the difference became not between have and have not but between have better and have not as good. Right? And that's a narrowing of inequality, a narrowing of consumption inequality. And we can look at some data here, too. All right? This is U.S. data. It's a lot of numbers up there. Let me see if, we, if I can, if I can you know, help you go through it. What this represents are various household appliances. The first four columns are what Americans below the poverty line, not just the lowest 20%, but below the poverty line, what percentage of American households below the poverty line 
owned, had in their house those goods in those years. And you can see the trend there, right? Poor Americans are increasingly likely, poor American households are increasingly likely to have all of those goods. All right. In 1971, that first column in bold, that was all American households in 1971. And 2005 is all American households in, in, uh, two, in, in 2005. Okay? So a couple things you can see there is that all American households had more of those things. But the poor American households in 2005 were in many ways better off than the average American household was in 1971 in terms of their ability to consume these goods. The poor are getting poorer. Right. Poor Americans, at least Americans today, and again, I, the Canadian data is similar and the Western European data, data is similar. Right. Poor households today are better off than middle class households were when I was about seven years old. Okay. And we've all gotten better off. A couple of things that have fallen, of course, are like telephones, right, uh, have, you know, have fallen off a bit. Why? Well, everyone's got a cell phone. My favorite one here is the cars one. If you look down in the bottom, in 2001, 73% of poor American households had a car. All right, let me tell you a little story about this, and you guys will particularly appreciate this story. In the 19, uh, Soviet Union in the 1940s, are you all familiar with the book, Grapes of, The Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck's book, The Grapes of Wrath? The Grapes of Wrath is a, is a Depression-era story about uh, how, about a, a family, an American family who is impoverished, who gets in their old car and drives across the United States during the Depression, and it's a horrible, depressing story about how terrible opportunities are for them, and, and, and you know, people get sick and it's awful. There was a film made of it, of course, and the Soviets decided to show the film as anti-capitalist propaganda. So they showed the film in Moscow, and after about a week, they had to yank it. Why? Because the audiences would watch, and they go, wait, wait, poor Americans have a car? <laughs> okay, so poor Russians, not so much. <laughs> So again, when we think about these, these comparisons, right, we have to, you know, the history is important. So let me just look at this data one other way. I took that same data and sort of rearranged it to, to, to create a gap between the poor and the rich. We can actually, there is data out there about what the top 20% have. That's that rich column is actually the top 20% of, of income earners in the United States. And what you can see here is between 2003 and 2005, just looking at those two dates that the most recent we have, the gap narrowed for most things. That is, the, the percentage of rich versus poor who own those things was getting smaller and smaller. That is, the poor were catching up to the rich, right? The gaps were shrinking. And at least well, the only thing that didn't shrink was stoves, really, for, uh, and telephones, obviously, because that's about cell phones as well. So, so again, are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? Does not, does not seem like it. Even our imperfect, heavily distorted, interfered with market economies have really uplifted the poor and, and enriched the middle class in the United States and generally made the world a more equal place than it used to be. Here's another way of thinking about my king and the commoner. Right? If you saw the king walking down the street, you'd know it was the king, right? Dressed fancy, bunch of horses, right? You'd know a commoner walking down the street. Today, let's say you're at some place busy like the airport and you look around. Can you actually honestly tell the difference between who's rich and who's poor? If you, there's a lot of rich, especially young, rich Americans. So if you saw them you know, dressed like this or standing around in t-shirt and jeans, right? There's no why because it's not like they can buy these you know, super awesome, elegant clothes that are so different than what the average person wears. We just can't tell rich or poor anymore ways we used to. That's an important leveling of society, right? A real reduction in the in the in inequality. And it's not like you know you go into a restaurant, the person at the next table could be fabulously rich. But they're not getting treated any differently than you are, usually. Right? <laughs> usually. Because okay. they people don't know, right? People don't know. If you've ever seen the movie Pretty Woman, right, where Julia Roberts goes into the store dressed, you know, poor in one case, right, and they 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 you know they do treat her differently because apparently she shouldn't be shopping in Beverly Hills. Okay. So last but not least, markets are not meritocracies. And uh, what I want to just a couple quick points I want to make here, then I'll, I'll take some questions. Um, one of the things that drives me crazy about Piketty's book, he has this very bad habit of not citing the actual words or names of people he disagrees with. He says things like, "Some people argue," or "Some research claims to have shown," right? And you know, who? Tell me who says that. All right, and he won't say, which is a very, very don't do that. It's a very bad, rude habit. 
Uh, it's also very unscholarly. All right? But one of the examples he frequently uses here is this idea that markets reward merit. Right? He claims that people who like markets think markets are good because they reward, through profits, people who have merit. Whatever merit means, morally better, who are smarter. I'm not sure exactly what he thinks we think it means, okay? but merit. All right? uh, and he believes that if he could somehow show that the people who make profits aren't especially meritorious, uh, that he's somehow shown that markets don't work very well. Well, guess what? No one believes this, right? Certainly not someone like Hayek, who's written a lot on this issue. He doesn't think that markets reward merit. He doesn't think, for example, that there's anything more meritorious about the rich than the poor, even if the rich have earned it on the market. It's one thing if you know, rich people get it by theft. We know they're not meritorious. Right? But even on the marketplace, people don't get rich because they have more merit than other people. Guess what? Here's how people get rich on the market. By creating value. Period. End of sentence. That's how you get rich. People love Facebook. I love Facebook. <laughs> people who are my Facebook friends understand. <laughs> I love Facebook. I'm very happy that Mark Zuckerberg and his friends invented Facebook. It thrills me no end that they are wealthy. Because actually, they've created probably more value for me than I have for them, okay? And so I, I benefit from this, right? Zuckerberg, and if you've seen the movie, right, he, he may be a jerk. I don't, it doesn't matter, okay? Markets don't reward people for being nice or for being mean or for being any of those things. They reward people for creating value, for taking capital goods and allocating them in ways that other people find to be valuable. Okay, and and that uh, that's a key point. And so showing that somehow markets don't reward merit, or that rich people aren't morally better, doesn't it's irrelevant. Right? The reason we like markets is because we need a way to figure out how to create value, how to allocate resources in the most effective ways possible. And it's markets that help us do that. And it's a very legitimate question whether politics, and certainly Piketty would like to see the government, the state, have a much bigger role, whether it's capable of doing the same. So, uh, so there's a few thoughts on Piketty's book uh, and some arguments that we might raise about both his sort of overall theoretical approach about some of these questions of inequality and mobility uh, and, and this last point about markets and, and meritocracy. So I think I will stop there and we've got time for questions. So thank you. <laughs>